Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Kind of smoky out there, isn't it? Mates for a nice sun sunrise and sunset, but it makes uh, my sinuses kind of plugged up. Uh, kickoff Sunday will be September 13th. We'll have worship at 8.30 and 11, and Sundays, an open house for Sunday school for children through youth will begin at 9.45, and adult Sunday school will begin at 9.45 on the 13th. So please plan accordingly. I appreciate you wearing your masks and social distancing. Yes, good morning. Good to see you. Yes. How many children are here? How many young people are here? Yes, good to see you. Yes. Uh, God bless you. God be with you. We bless you, and we are so happy that you are here. Yes. Uh, what does this look like? Yes, a key. Yes, this is a key. Uh, all the places, important places, people lock the door. So whenever you want to enter a, a good place, a really good place, important place, you need the key, right? If you can enter into whatever place you want with this key, where would you want to go? You can go wherever you want with this key. Where would you like to go? Think about that. <laughs> yes. Where do you want to go, kids? With this key, you can go everywhere. Think about that. How about the place where our God is? Kingdom of heaven, the paradise, the heaven, right? We should go there. So that's really, really great place, an important place. So we need a key to enter into the kingdom of heaven. We need a key. Today, Jesus asked his disciples, his followers, what do people say about who the Son of Man is? And disciples answered, some say he's the John the Baptist, others say, oh, he's the Elijah, still others say he's Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And right at the moment, Peter, the famous guy, Peter, said to Jesus, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Peter said that. And Jesus was so happy with that answer. And Jesus said to Peter, God bless you. You didn't get that answer, not out of books, not from teachers not from any other human beings, but from my Father in heaven. And Peter, I tell you, I will build my church on this rock, on you, and nothing, nothing will be able to overcome it, even death. And you know what? I will give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you will bind on earth will be bind in heaven. What you will lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So what is the key to the kingdom of heaven? It's a faith. It's a faith that Jesus is a Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the key to the kingdom of heaven. Do you have the key keys? Yes, we have the keys. We have Jesus. Jesus is the Lord. God is with us. Jesus is the Lord. So we have the key. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for your love, your grace for each of us. We would like to see you face to face. We want to live with you. We want to enter the place where our Almighty God is. So, Lord, thank you for the key, the faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Amen.
Let us have some silent time for prayer and let's pray together. Lord, Heavenly Father, Yahweh, the God Almighty, we praise you and worship you. We want to glorify your name. We lift up our praises and thanksgiving. We want to magnify your name. We are here with the hunger and thirst for the world, the world of life, the world of grace. Although there are so many places to go, so many things to do in this world, we are here, Lord, with a longing heart, sincere heart. We love you, Lord. We bless you. Oh, Lord, bless us. Give us your love, your faithful love. You are faithful. Your faithfulness endures forever. Help us to be faithful before you and before others. Oh, Lord, search me and know me. Search our hearts and see if there are any evil thoughts, evil desires. We repent our sins. We are sinners. We are all sinners. We live by sight, not by faith. Help us to live by faith. We were judgmental. More often, we didn't try to understand others. We didn't try to get out of our selfishness. We didn't forgive others. We were not gracious to others. We were resentful. Lord, forgive us. Lord, be gracious to us and have mercy on us. Lord, can we change? Do we have any power to change? Be with us, Lord. Be merciful to your children. We are your children. Don't let the enemies mock the Almighty God by seeing our failures and our pain and suffering. Do not abandon the works of your hands. We trust in Jesus, the Son of the living God. We have the name Jesus. We have the power, not our own power, but you are power. Let the enemies know that God is living, that God reigns, that God is the sovereign God. Lord, let people know what you have done to us, your wonderful deeds and the mighty acts that you've done for us. Bless these people, bless this church, bless this community, the city, Casper, Wyoming, Bless this country. Bless the leaders of the country. Give them your, your wisdom and your vision. Lord, heal us, comfort us. Give us hope every day, the everlasting hope in you. Give us the purpose and the, the courage we can live with in this world until we see the everlasting God face to face in the nation. So now, with a grateful mind, 
We pray the prayer you taught us when you were with us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, Brent. Well done. This morning's scripture in two parts. The first from Paul's letter to the book, to the book, <laughs> Paul's letter to the church at Rome, chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy, in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. And from the Matthew Gospel, chapter 16, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, 
and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Recently, I went to get a new driver's license since I had moved. Um, I waited for about an hour. My number was called. And I told the clerk that I wanted an identification that reflected my current address. He looked at my license, looked confused, and then looked at me. This license doesn't expire for several years. Why do you need a new one? I said, so that I have identification that reflects who I really am. I can't travel without that. Huh, he said, I guess so. A driver's license is what, what, but one form of identification, a legal document that's proof that we live in Casper, Wyoming, and we're more than a legal document. With the advent of smartphones and social media, ref, uh, researchers can cross-reference app uses, usage and demographics of people to predict a person's age, gender, and marital status and income between 61 and 82% accurate. For instance, if you have the Pinterest app on your phone, you're a woman, most likely. You know, that's a website and an app for crafting and cooking. Our choice of app for restaurants tell us about our income. If you use Yelp, you probably earn $52,000 a year or more. But if you use Foursquare, you earn less than that. Have you ever searched on Amazon for something and then got a whole bunch of emails about encouraging you to look at a similar product? Well, the information we seek this in this day and age tells a lot about us. And we are much more than our app, our smartphone. Of course we're more than that. Our identity is made up of many things. It's physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual. Both today's passages are about identity. Beginning with our passage from Matthew, we will explore the question that Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And our passage from Romans will give us some insight as to who we are as a church. We find Jesus and the disciples in the district of Caesarea Philippi, which is where a lot of pagans lived, who believed that the cave near the city was the home to the Greek god Pan, who was the half man, half goat god of fright. Pan is where the word panic comes from. Pan's cave was the entrance to Hades, the underworld or the realm of the dead. The city of Caesarea Philippi was built by Herod Philip in honor of Caesar. And the designation of Philippi was added to distinguish it from Caesarea Maritima, built by Herod the Great on the Mediterranean coast. I think it's really interesting that a place associated with two significant rulers is also a place identified with the personification of evil and death. That's where Jesus chooses to bring up the question of his own identity. Who do you say that I am? The disciples report to Jesus that he is John the Baptist or Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? With confidence, Simon says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Right there in the very location to be believed to be the gateway to Hades, Jesus calls Simon Peter. And then he tells him that 
Peter is the rock on which the church will be built, the church where human need and divine presence meet. Jesus then makes a promise. He says, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. He means the church. The church is a community of believers built on the rock of Peter all the way down to us. Hades was seen as the realm of the dead, and all things have a lifespan. Institutions, lifestyles, and civilizations rise and fall. And the church, not necessarily a denomination or a human manifestation, will survive into eternity. That's the promise. The believers in Jesus will have life forever. Do you know what that means? We can be bold as we shape the church. We can take risks because the church is eternal. Why should we fear failure or change when Christ tells us that the church will endure? So who is Jesus? The one who transforms those who follow him to become the foundation of the church. Who is Jesus? The fulfillment of the promise of eternal life. Jesus tells Peter he has been given the keys to the kingdom and then talks about binding and loosing. What's that all about? Bunku helped us understand that a little bit. The keys to the kingdom is the power that allowed Peter to recognize Jesus as the Messiah. He knows that his identity is in Christ. It's the same knowledge that we have about who Christ is in our lives. Bound and loose come from the requests of scribes and rabbis for interpretations of the law. Loose means a request is approved as in free from restraint, and bound means not approved, as in tied or bound together. Whatever is not approved on earth will not be approved in heaven, and whatever it frees us on earth will free us in heaven. Jesus knows that the disciples have faith, that they are very human, and he gives them the authority to make decisions about what it means to be the church on earth. Christ's followers are to inform, to share, and to teach about their knowledge of Jesus Christ. Through prayer and Bible study, we learn what frees us and what binds us. And those are the stories of Christ in our lives that we are to share with others. In the last verse of today's passage from Matthew, Jesus sternly orders the disciples not to tell anyone that he is the Messiah. This is a difficult passage, but by the end of the gospel, he instructs the disciples to tell the world about him. It makes sense to me that for us, this is a reminder to evangelize. How we tell others about Christ is very important. Evangelism begins with a conversation, getting to know someone, listening to their story, arguing never guides other people to belief or acceptance of Christ. How we live, what binds us and what frees us, shows others who Jesus is in our lives. Who are we then if we accept Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Well, like Peter, we are transformed into Jesus' followers. And as his followers, we have a place in the community of faith. In listening to many faith stories over the years, it seems to me that folks have two broad experiences of accepting Jesus as the Son of the living God. Some folks have before and after experiences, like the Apostle Paul. He was struck blind on the road to Damascus and had an experience of the risen Christ. He was transformed from a persecutor of Christians into an apostle of Christ. Some folks, like Peter, have the undeniable urge to follow Jesus, or they've always known that they have been loved, and then they can point to different events in their lives where their faith is deepened and they have grown closer and closer to Christ. However we have come to know Christ, our identity in him has changed us and transformed us. Now, I don't remember a time when I was not loved. 
I had wonderful parents and a huge extended family that loved me. I grew up in the Methodist Church. I began attending Inglewood United, well, it was Inglewood Methodist Church then, when I was three years old. I have significant memories from those early years, uh, being in second grade Sunday school and having a missionary from Korea come to visit us. I remember receiving my Bible in worship after I'd memorized the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments. And at home that afternoon, my mother, the librarian, showed my sister and I how to properly open a new book and then read to us our favorite Bible stories. But unfortunately, the church in the 1960s and 1970s meant that family was a mom, dad, and the kids. And after my father died, we were just mom and the kids. We no longer fit the mold, and we weren't included in family-oriented events. And I quit going to church when I was in junior high school. During my first job as a nurse, I had two patients whom I, to whom I was very close. Now, this was in the day and age when you could stay in the hospital more than a few days. Both of these patients died within two weeks of each other, and I had a hard time dealing with the grief. So I began going to Mass as I worked at a Catholic hospital, but it didn't quite feed my soul. So I started going to Trinity United Methodist Church in downtown Denver. And honestly, I chose that church because it had a big singles group, and I thought maybe I could find a husband. But God had other ideas. I thought that at, at church, I learned that being a nurse was a spiritual gift, a calling. My curiosity about the Bible was fed by Disciple Bible Study. And one Sunday when a lady collapsed in church, I helped resuscitate her. She was sent to the hospital where I worked, and I followed her through her course of treatment. On the day she was to go home, she died suddenly. And as I sat with her family, I knew in my heart that Jesus was working through me to comfort them, and this was not the first time this had happened to me. When a friend asked me, do you think God is calling you into ministry, I said no. And I said no quite a bit. When I enrolled in seminary is when I began to say yes. I loved my life as a nurse, and answering God's call to professional ministry has been the best thing I've ever done and the absolute hardest thing I have ever done. Think about your own faith story. What was your first memory of being loved, of feeling that you belonged, or feeling that you were an outcast? What challenges have you faced and then knew that there was something greater than yourself guiding you, calling you to serve? Did you have a before and after experience where your life was drastically changed by the love of Christ? Who were the people that showed you the face of Christ? Who are we? And how have we been transformed by Christ? And how can we tell others about that experience? Who we are and who Christ is in our lives is important. And our passage from Romans talks about our identity as well. Paul begins today's verses from an individual point of view and ends with a community beginning with presenting our bodies as a holy and living sacrifice acceptable to God and ending with one body with many members who have gifts according to the grace that was given to us. As individuals, we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and as a church, we are part of one body, that of Jesus. What does it take to be the church? Well, as with the passage from Matthew, we are transformed and changed by the renewing of our minds in Christ. We are to pray and study and serve, and God will show us what his will is for us, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. This does not say that serving God in the name of Jesus will always be comfortable, easy, or without mistakes. What does it take to be the church? Well, Paul introduces humility in verse 3. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. That is a countercultural message these days when we're all about building up our bodies, our wealth, our toys, our power, our control. Why not? We're worth it. We are of immeasurable value. Isn't that biblical? Well, sure it is. We are, 
What are human beings that you are mindful of them, wrote the author of Psalm 8, that you make them a little lower than God, crowned with glory and honor. Luke tells us that God knows the number of hairs on our head and we are more valued than a sparrow. But when self-esteem, the emphasis on self-esteem, turns us into thinking that we're better than other people, that's where we get into trouble. The love of God through Jesus Christ is not a competition. It is a gift of grace. The love of Jesus Christ is a gift that we give and receive as one body, the church. Giving and receiving the gift of love through Jesus Christ takes a commitment of our whole body. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Jesus calls us then to do our faith, not just think about it. Our identity as followers of Jesus Christ comes through our hands and our feet, as well as our thoughts and our words. It's a sacrifice. It's a gift we give away. Gifts that are different, and when they're used properly, they bring about unity. Unity is not uniformity. We don't all have the same gift, the same opinion, the same experience, but we do have the same Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. As a church, this body of Christ is hurting. The past few years have been incredibly difficult. In the recent past, staff changes have been very unsettling. Pastoral leadership has not been solid. Secrets have been kept under the guise of not hurting somebody's feelings. Rumors and gossip have replaced honest discussions. Heap on top of that a worldwide pandemic and the continued struggle with racism. It's no wonder we are in pain. I invite you to come and talk with me. Make an appointment's best. Call the office during business hours. And I also invite you to come to another courageous conversation. This one will be about healing. It will be on September 19th and 26th at 9 a.m. to noon in the Fellowship Hall. I just need you to know that there is confidential information about the staff and the pastors that I will not share with you. But I am here to listen and to hear what you have to say to help us identify where God is calling us to be as a church. Who is Jesus? The one who transforms us to follow him and become the foundation to the church. Who is Jesus? The fulfillment of the promise that life is eternal. How we live, what binds us and what frees us shows others who Jesus is in our lives. What does it take to be the church? Humility. The love of Christ is a gift that we give and receive as one body, and we make a commitment of our whole selves. And when our body is hurting like this one is, it is only together that we can allow God, through Jesus Christ, to enter our hearts and be healed. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you for the gift of grace that you have given to each one of us. And Lord, we are before you today acknowledging our woundedness. And we present our entire selves to you so that you may heal us, so that we may be the faithful followers of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.
pray. God of all creation, as we offer our gifts to you this day, we remember the question Jesus put to his disciples. Who do people say that I am? But who do you say that I am? We pray that we might be ready to answer with our lips but also with our lives and with our gifts. You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. In his holy name we pray. Amen.
Jesus is the one who changes us, so we become the foundation of the church. Jesus is the one who made sacrifices, so life is eternal. Who are we? We are one body, the church of Jesus Christ. Amen.